Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abbas Zaidi, and um, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me here to give this talk, which is entitled The Cardiac Evaluation of Athletes. So, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am a cardiology registrar and research fellow, uh, and I'm based at St George's Hospital in London, and I'm also enrolled for a higher degree at St George's University of London. Um, my funding is from Cardiac Risk in the Young, and at St George's we have the Cry Centre for Sports Cardiology and Inherited Cardiac Diseases, which is headed by Professor Sanjay Sharma and is manned by his team of research fellows. Now, as part of my work with CRY, I'm involved in the pre-participation screening of elite athletes from a variety of sporting organisations, which include UK Athletics, the Rugby Football Union, the English Institute of Sport, the Football Association and the British Lawn Tennis Association. And we're privileged this year to have been involved in the screening of the Team GB Olympic athletes. Now, the screening of professional athletes has sometimes been called the million dollar medical. And I'd like to just try and illustrate to you how this sort of term has come about. Now, let's take as an example the newly appointed captain of the England football team. It is this charming young individual, Mr. Wayne Rooney. Now, Wayne, <laughs> Wayne, takes home from Manchester United an annual paycheck which is worth about £8 million a year. On top of that, from sponsorship, he earns a further £9 million a year. And what about what Wayne generates for his club? Well, it's estimated that ticketing and merchandising at Man U are worth £108 million a year. Sky Sports has a contract with the Premier League which is worth a billion pounds a year. And if teams are to win uh, silverware and trophies, then they generate even more money for their team. And sadly for the Manchester United fans in the audience, um, I don't know if Dr. Bear's here, uh, but no, this was a big zero this year. So <laughs> we wish Man U better luck next year. But you can see that being a professional athlete can be a very lucrative business. Now, the flip side of the million dollar medical is this sort of scene that sadly we're all too familiar with. This is Fabrice Mwamba recently when he suffered a cardiac arrest on the field of play. Now, he was lucky enough to survive, but we do know that individuals engaged in uh, a competitive athletic activity are much more likely to suffer sudden cardiac death than their non-athletic counterparts. This paper, for example, from Pref Professor Corrado, going back more than 10 years now, shows in the black bars, athletes, and in the white bars, non-athletes. And you are 2.8 times more likely to suffer sudden cardiac death if you're an athlete. Now, it must be emphasized that those athletes suffering cardiac arrest in the vast majority of cases, have underlying undiagnosed cardiac, inherited or congenital conditions. Therefore, the European Society of Cardiology has issued guidelines suggesting that if an athlete is found to have one of the cardiomyopathies or iron channel disorders, they should not be allowed to compete in competitive sports. So coming back to this idea of the million dollar medical, you can see how important it is that we get it right when we see an athlete. Because if we erroneously label Wayne with a cardiac condition that he doesn't have, then he could go from doing this with his days to joining the back of the dole queue. But more importantly, if we miss a condition in Wayne, then we could end up with a situation like this. Now, of course, all of our athletes, whether professional, high level or elite, are equally important to us. But this illustrates the point that there's a lot of st at stake here. So with this in mind, the ESC has recommended what should be done for the pre-participation evaluation of athletes. They suggest that each should undergo personal and family history, a physical examination and a 12 lead ECG. And if the findings are negative, then they are eligible for sports participation. Now, this sounds very easy, some of you might be thinking, but I'd like to put it to you that this might not always be as straightforward as it sounds, because the athlete's heart is subject to a variety of electrical, structural and functional modifications. High vagal tone in athletes results in bradycardia and repolarization anomalies on the ECG. The bradycardia permits enhanced diastolic filling, which in turn allows augmentation of stroke volume during exercise. And over a period of time, these changes result in structural adaptations, including increased left ventricular wall thickness and cavity dimensions. To illustrate this point further, take for example this ECG taken from a 30-year-old sedentary accountant. Now contrast this with the ECG taken from a 30-year-old Olympic rower. And you can see that these two ECGs are very different. Our Olympic rower demonstrates a number of interesting findings, including sinus bradycardia, 
voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, ST segment elevation, early repolarization, and prominent U waves. What about if we look at the echocardiogram of our Olympic rower? Well, the left-hand panel shows that there is symmetrical enlargement of all four chambers of the heart in our rower. And on the right-hand panel, we can see that there is mild left ventricular hypertrophy in this healthy athlete. And this is a fairly typical echocardiogram for an elite athlete. Therefore, a common dilemma faced by the sports cardiologist is the differentiation between physiological remodeling in the healthy athlete's heart versus cardiomyopathy. And it is known that sudden death in young athletes is attributable in 44% of cases to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Therefore, a recurring theme in this talk will be the differentiation between athletic remodeling and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what do we do when we get an athlete for evaluation? Well, it's important to emphasize that in the vast majority of cases, disease can be excluded and the athlete reassured with simple techniques. All of our athletes undergo clinical and family history and a physical examination, as well as a 12 lead ECG. And in most cases, we can reassure with these tests. Some will also undergo an echocardiogram on the day of the screening. And where there is doubt, we will invite them back to St. George's for further testing, which will include halter monitoring, exercise testing, and some other tests, which I'll take you through in detail. So in the personal history, we are looking for red flags, things like exertional chest pain or dizziness, unheralded syncope, excessive breathlessness, palpitations, and erroneous diagnosis of epilepsy, or known prior cardiac disease. In the family history, we're looking for known heritable disorders, premature coronary artery disease, and sudden deaths, epilepsy, unexplained drownings, and road traffic accidents, all of which may be indicators of an undiagnosed familial cardiac condition. We go on to perform a physical examination. We check the height and weight of our athletes, check their blood pressure, and we'll feel the pulse where we may pick up things like atrial fibrillation or uh, coarctation of the aorta. We'll listen to the heart as we may hear murmurs in things like valvular heart diseases or the septal defects. And rarely we may pick up conditions such as familial hypercholesterolemia or Marfan syndrome. However, by far and above, the most important investigation in the athlete is the 12 lead ECG. The ESC has described the anomalies seen on the athlete's ECG as group one and group two. Group one are considered common and training related and should not prompt further investigation if seen on their own. And these include things like sinus bradycardia, first degree heart block, incomplete right bundle branch block, isolated voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy and early repolarization. And then we have the group two anomalies which are considered uncommon and unrelated to training and should prompt further investigation. And these include things like T-wave inversions, ST-segment depression, pathological Q-waves, left atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, pre-excitation, complete bundle branch block, prolongation of the QT interval, and the Brigada phenotype. So I'd just like to show you some ECGs that we have seen in some of our athletes. Now, some diagnoses are more obvious than others. We can see in this athlete, for example, that there is a short PR interval, and there is a delta wave, a slurred delta wave before each QRS complex. And this, in the presence of symptoms suggestive of a reentrant arrhythmia, is suggestive of the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or diagnostic. And this puts the athlete at risk of rapidly pre-excited ventricular arrhythmias. What about this athlete? Well, we can see a group two anomaly here, which is prolongation of the QT interval. And in the presence of prominent notching of the T wave in leads V2 and V3, this is suggestive of the congenital long QT syndrome, which puts our athlete at risk of torsade de point polymorphic VT. And what about this athlete? Well, we see one of the group one anomalies, left ventricular hypertrophy by voltage criteria, which is allowed on its own, but we also have some group two anomalies, including left atrial enlargement with this deep negative P wave in V1, right atrial enlargement with a tall P wave in the inferior leads, and most strikingly, there's deep T wave inversion in the lateral leads, and this athlete turned out to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <coughs> what about this athlete? Once again, 
we see a group 1 anomaly of left ventricular hypertrophy by voltage, but we also see some group 2 changes, including Q waves in the anterior leads and, strikingly, lateral ST segment depression and T wave inversion. And once again, this is fairly typical of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And one final ECG, we can see here, once again, a group 2 anomaly of T wave inversion, this time in the right precordial leads from V1 to V4. And in the absence of ST segment elevation in the same leads, this is suggestive or suspicious for the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about this because you'll be hearing about the right heart from Dr. Lagersh later on today. Now, there is one exception to the rule of the group 1 and group 2 anomalies, and that is the black athlete. Black athletes comprise a large proportion of the elite athletes around the world, and for reasons that are not fully understood, appear to be at greater risk of sudden death than their Caucasian counterparts. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk uh, in detail about black athletes, but suffice to say that the ECG of healthy black athletes can sometimes look strikingly different from that of their Caucasian counterparts. And if you want to hear more about that, then Dr. Papadakis will be giving a talk next. So we move on to the next most important investigation, and that is the echocardiogram. Now, there are a number of conditions that can be quite easily diagnosed on echocardiography, and these are things like septal defects and valvular heart disease. And note that these will usually not be picked up on the ECG alone. However, more difficult to diagnose in their early stages are the cardiomyopathies, and so I'm going to talk about this in some detail. Recall that the athlete's heart undergoes physiological remodeling. So in order to be able to recognize pathology, we must first be able to define what is normal for a healthy athlete. So going back more than 20 years now to the work of Professor Pelliccia, we know that the left ventricular wall thickness of athletes increases to the extent that around 2% of healthy athletes demonstrates an LV wall thickness that resembles hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The left ventricular internal cavity also increases in size in healthy athletes, to such an extent that 14% of athletes resemble dilated cardiomyopathy. Therefore, for a Caucasian male athlete, the left ventricular wall thickness should not exceed 12 millimeters, and for a female Caucasian, not more than 11 millimeters. Black athletes demonstrate an even more striking degree of physiological left ventricular hypertrophy, with up to 18% resembling hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and these are healthy black athletes. Therefore, for a black male athlete, the left ventricular wall should not exceed 15 millimeters, and for a black female, not more than 12. In fact, the determinants of a large heart in athletes have been shown to be adult age, male sex, large body surface area, black ethnicity, and endurance sports participation. Now, returning to the theme of differentiating athlete's heart from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because this is a common dilemma that we face. There are a number of indices that can help us on echocardiography. The first is the ratio of the left ventricular wall thickness to the cavity dimension. Take, for example, two athletes with mild left ventricular hypertrophy at 13 millimeters. One of them has concomitant dilatation of the left ventricular cavity, and this is suggestive of physiological remodeling. The other, in comparison, has a small left ventricular cavity, and this is much more typical of the pattern of remodeling in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What about systolic function? Well, systolic function, the ejection fraction in athletes should be normal or sometimes appear sluggish at rest, whereas in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is often hyperdynamic. Long axis function is a very sensitive indicator of early subclinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, such that it should be normal in healthy athletes but may well be reduced in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This tissue Doppler trace of the lateral LV free wall showing reduced longitudinal S prime velocities in an HCM patient. Newer techniques such as strain can also be helpful, such that strain should be normal in athletes, but may well be reduced in HCM. This strain curve from a healthy athlete is normal, whereas in an HCM case, we see reduced strain values. Diastolic function is also a very sensitive indicator of early subclinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, such that the EA ratio is often high, above two sometimes, in a healthy athletes, whereas in HCM, it may well be reduced, as we see here. 
or reversed. The deceleration time of the E-wave in the compliant ventricle of the athlete is rapid, whereas deceleration in the stiff ventricle in HCM may be increased. E-prime velocity is normal or high, sometimes in the order of 20 centimetres per second in healthy athletes, but may be reduced in HCM. Again, this tissue Doppler trace of the lateral LV wall showing low E-prime velocities in HCM. And finally, E to E-prime should be low in athletes and may well be increased in HCM. Uh, all of these slides will be available, I believe, afterwards on the website. Um, now, coming on to morphology, we can get some useful indices of morphology uh, which indicate a possible diagnosis of HCM. For example, we should not see in healthy athletes bizarre patterns of left ventricular hypertrophy, including apical or asymmetric thickening, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, abnormal papillary muscles, mitral valve defects and mitral regurgitation, and gross enlargement of the left atrium. So once again, I'd emphasize that these simple inquiries and investigations will be able to exclude disease in the majority of our athletes. In some cases, we may need to move on to some further tests. And this will include the following. Holter monitoring. The presence of ventricular arrhythmias is suggestive of an underlying pathological substrate. Bradyarrhythmias may be seen in athletes with syncope, suggestive of premature conduction system disease. And we may see transient appearance of the Brigada or long QT phenotypes. Exercise testing plays an important role in the assessment of athletes, such that healthy athletes should not exhibit symptoms such as chest pain during exercise, ST segment changes, and ventricular arrhythmias, all suggestive of an underlying pathological substrate. Furthermore, the blood pressure in healthy individuals should rise during exercise, whereas in cardiomyopathies, it may be flat or drop. In addition, we can sometimes see paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval in individuals with long QT syndrome. We may see transient appearance of the Brigada phenotype in recovery in the Brigada syndrome. And exercise testing may also play a role in the risk stratification of Wolf Parkinson White to see if the delta wave is able to conduct at high heart rates. Now, cardiac MRI can also play an important role in the assessment of athletes. I'm not going to talk in detail about this because you'll be hearing about this from Dr. O'Hanlon in about half an hour. Suffice to say that cardiac MRI is better than echo at looking at the lateral free wall, the apex of the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and it can demonstrate uh, fibrosis upon gadolinium administration. Cardiac CT may play a role in some cases. For example, in the detection of premature coronary atherosclerosis in athletes with chest pain or familial hypercholesterolemia. However, the most compelling indication for cardiac CT in our athletes remains the detection of coronary artery anomalies. Now, in the interest of time, this slide can be found on our website subsequently, but I would just like to show you this 3D CT reconstruction of an anomalous right coronary artery arising from the left coronary sinus and coursing in between the aorta and pulmonary artery, and this is a high-risk variant for sudden death in athletes. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing has an important role in the differentiation from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from athlete's heart. Recall that in HCM, we have a thick, stiff left ventricle with poor diastolic function, left ventricular outflow tract in up to 70% of cases during exercise, and microvascular ischemia. Now, all of these factors together result in a failure to augment stroke volume during exercise and low peak oxygen consumption. In fact, it's been shown that athlete's heart is much more likely than physiological LVH if the peak VO2 is more than 50 or is more than 120% of that predicted for the age, sex, and size of the athlete. Detraining can play a role in some cases where we have diagnostic difficulty. Take, for example, this healthy-looking athlete who, however, demonstrates T-wave inversions in the lateral leads and has mild left ventricular hypertrophy. And the question arises when we see this kind of athlete is, is this athletic remodeling or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Now, if we can convince him to detrain for four to six weeks, we may get some useful information. Now, athletes don't like to detrain, so usually it needs something like this to happen. So when this athlete comes back after four to six weeks, we, he may be a bit, bit more rough around the edges, but we may get some useful clinical information. We may, for example, see 
that the left vent, uh, L, uh, sorry, T wave inversion has resolved and the left ventricular hypertrophy has regressed, which would be suggestive of physiological remodeling. Genetic testing may play a role in some cases. However, I would emphasize that genetics is not yet widely available. It is prohibitively expensive, and there's a lengthy wait for results which can be disruptive to training. And most importantly, there is a lack of correlation between genotype and phenotype, because at present, our understanding of the genetic causation of the inherited cardiac conditions remains poor. This table, for example, demonstrating that the yield of genetic testing in some of the inherited conditions is as low as 25%. Therefore, genetics should really be used for confirmation of clinically suspected cases. I would say, however, that ECG evaluation of first-degree relatives can be invaluable, and I'll return to this shortly. Electrophysiological testing may be helpful in some cases. Perhaps um, the indication that we refer for uh, most commonly would be for ablation of accessory pathways, and there can also be helpful in risk stratification of asymptomatic pre-excitation where the athlete does not want an ablation. And features such as multiple accessory pathways have been found to be a high-risk feature for sudden death. And other investigations that we sometimes use are things like the signal average ECG for the diagnosis of ARVC, the adjmaline provocation test for diagnosis of Brigada syndrome, and the epinephrine test for diagnosis of the long QT syndrome. I'd like to finish with a two-minute case study, if I may. Um, so this is a 44-year-old male ultra-marathon runner. Now, he's been running these mountain and desert races for more than 15 years. He had an ECG performed by his GP purely for bradycardia. He's got no symptoms, no past medical history, family history, and a normal examination. And his ECG looks like this. Now, in the interest of time, I'll point out that there are a number of group two anomalies. There is right axis deviation. There is left atrial enlargement with a deep biphasic P wave in V1. There is infralateral T wave inversion and a degree of ST segment depression in the inferior leads. So the dilemma arises, athlete's heart or HCM. So a quick show of hands, please, for athlete's heart. OK. So we've got a few takers and a show of hands for HCM. OK, so we've got quite a few don't knows, and probably most people coming out on athlete's heart so far. OK, so let's have a look at his echocardiogram. Well, the left ventricular wall thickness is, uh, in the septum is 14 millimetres. And recall that a Caucasian male should not exceed 12 millimetres. The left ventricular cavity is relatively small at 44 millimetres. The left atrium is not dilated. There's no anterior motion of the mitral valve, no outflow tract obstruction. The EA ratio is normal. And diastolic function reveals excellent systolic relax, um, diastolic relaxation velocities. We put him on a halter monitor, and there were no ventricular arrhythmias. He had an exercise test, an exercise for a fantastic 21 minutes of Bruce protocol. The blood pressure rose appropriately. There were no arrhythmias and no ST segment changes. And we went on to perform a cardiopulmonary exercise test, and he got a great value for VO2 max of 67. Now recall that a value above 50 is suggestive of athlete's heart rather than HCM. So a show of hands again at this point for athlete's heart. OK, so we've got a few takers there, quite a few takers, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. OK, so the overwhelming majority now coming out on in favor of athlete's heart. So in order to clinch the diagnosis, we sent him for a cardiac MRI scan. And this revealed ischemia, in the left ventricular wall on stress perfusion and areas of fibrosis after gadolinium administration. We performed ECGs on the mother and the sister and both had ECGs suggestive of HCM. And finally, we performed genetic testing and all three family members had a myosin binding protein C mutation, clinching the diagnosis of morphologically mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, this slide for differentiation of HGM from athlete's heart can be found on our website. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it is vital to correctly recognize cardiovascular disease in athletes, but there is significant overlap between physiological remodeling and disease. Athlete's heart versus HGM is a common dilemma, particularly in black athletes, but in the vast majority of cases, we can make the distinction with simple investigations and reassure our athletes, and in a few cases, further tests may be required.
Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.